one oh dear this is written so small and my eyes are not good uh, one is novuyo novuyo chuma tuma okay <laughs> okay who is a writer she has written uh, two award winning books and we are really excited she's such a revolutionary in the way she thinks about history that it, it it's really i I've, I've enjoyed just reading what her thoughts and i'm looking forward to reading her book and then we have uh, njuke gidedwa who is a student of social movements in South Africa, and we are looking forward to what he has to say because history is very tied to social movements. And lastly, I am very honored to introduce Din Dina Salustio, who is from Cape Verde. I just read her book, The Mad Woman of Serrano, which was a very exciting and very well told, beautiful story about love and history. Yes, yeah. Um, so uh, we are going to have a discussion for a few minutes and then we'll open, we'll open the discussion to all of us. I don't know if uh, Jeth Jethro, is he here? Yep. Is not yet here. In, any Portuguese speaker here also? Okay, all right, we'll, we'll continue waiting for him. So I'm going to ask the panelists to start by uh, telling us about uh, to say something about the history of their country and not hopefully not what we something that they would like us to know about their countries that is not told in the pop popular mediated narratives about your countries so one is from zimbabwe one is from kenya and one is from cape Verde, and these are all countries which have uh have contested histories, especially in the global imagination. So I want to start with, um, with Novuyo because you, she, she articulates this so well. So that will give us the pace for the rest of the discussion. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is uh, Wandia Joya. I teach at Desta University and my specialization is Francophone African literature. So I'm really always excited when we are talking with African writers from other countries. So Karibuni Sana. So Navuya. Uh, you, you have set high expectations. Uh, hey. <laughs> um, good morning. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here uh, in Kenya and to be with my fellow pan panelists. Um, so it's a great honor to be with Dina. Um, I'm looking forward to reading your book. Um, I feel like you are, you are like our Tsitsi Dangarimba in Zimbabwe. She was the first black female woman. She was the first woman to publish, the first black African woman to have a novel published in Zimbabwe, in contemporary Zimbabwe. So you know, I was, I'm really looking forward to um, And um, social movements, oh wow. Um, it's going to be quite a the discussion. Um, so Zimbabwe, so one of the sort of interesting things, and I think this is true, of Kenya, South Africa, m many of our post-colonial societies, but over the past two, three decades, the main contention in Zimbabwe, right, and through the whole political, economic, the figure of Mugabe, history has been at the center of that contestation, right? Um, which history to tell, whose history, and more importantly in Zimbabwe, who has the right, who has the right to tell that history, who has the right to own that history, right? And in a sense, whose Zimbabwe is this? So um, in going back um, in understanding our liberation history, I was very interested in the less told stories. Um, so of course, right now in Zimbabwe, we have, so Kenya, if I understand, had Kanu and Kadu. We had Zanu and Zapu. And the mainstream history that's told is a Zanu version of history. It's a highly politicized history, um, highly controlled, that does not leave space for what I'd call the ordinary stories. For instance, there were a lot of labor movements in the 60s and 70s in Zimbabwe. There were urban women who were involved um, in those movements and they've more or less been wiped out from history. Now, in my research, there were fascinating stories. Um, we had the Rhodesian African rifles, which is something we never learn about in Zimbabwe. And for me, that concept of having a black African army fighting for Rhodesia um, was very fascinating. Within 
the liberation movements, there were rebellions within the rebellion, as we call them, um, and there were struggles within the struggle. So those fissures um, are what I was really interested in at the very human level. Uh, men who deserted, um, men who fled the war, but after liberation claimed the, 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 war, the, the status of hero, because to be a hero in Zimbabwe is something of great pride. To have not fought in the war gives you the status of a nobody, i.e. you have very little claim to history. Um, and what's important is that those fissures that began um, during the liberation struggle have impacted Zimbabwe post-liberation. So uh, we think of Zimbabwe's um, um, first sin, which was the Kukuraundi massacres. Um, it's, it's like a period that we don't really talk about, similar to the Wakala massacres in Kenya. So I was also very interested in that. But from a fictional point of view, which is Zimbabwe were a highly educated country, as we say, were, were also very interested in figures and numbers and the very intellectualization of ideas. And that's something that also came, I think, with the Cold War and that sort of authoritarian um, stream of thought. So the idea for me for fiction is to loosen our ideas, to move away from figures to the more controversial question of the value of the African, and not just the black African body, which is what internationally everyone always worries about, the African psyche, right? the African philosophy. Um, how do we value that? It's, it's little valued. And so how do we bring value? How do we bring value just to the idea of that life is sacrosanct? Is it or is it not? Um, and we talk about it a lot in our cultures, but I think on the political sphere, in policy, in our everyday lives, that doesn't really translate. So that's that's the history I'm very interested in, and of course the history that you know it, it, it questions um, Mugabe. You know what, what's Mugabe's role in Zimbabwe? You know he's also a mythified figure. These mythified big men in our countries, where were they and what did they do, and why are we not allowed to ask those questions and try and find out what was going on during that time? I, I, now that she has mentioned Mugabe, I've thought that I want to put this in your, as you answer the question, we have our own mythical figure, uh, Jomo Kenyatta. So what has that meant for Kenyan history and the way it is told by us to ourselves and how it is told, how it is told by others about us? Yeah, thank you and good morning everyone. Uh, I think it's, it's a great pleasure for me as well to be to be here with these great stars of literature. I think I've read all of them, and of course, it's, it's almost a local library in terms of uh, struggle. But but before I go ahead, in terms of uh, in, in terms of uh, responding to the the Kenyatta and the dilemma of uh, of liberty independence that we we were faced with, uh, I will first of all go to the, the 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 colonial history because I think like all like all colonial states, uh, post-colonial states today. I, I think our history has been configured to start uh, with the coming colonialism, which is completely a fallacy because there was a lot of history that was there before the end of the white people and uh, colonialism in the, in, the, in the 1880s. But since uh, we have been configured by colonialism, I think the story then, the history of it all, we began with the colonial, colonial uh, and then since my interest is completed, that liberation history, which was being waged uh, during the times of uh, colonialism and even today, and I think in my country, Kenya, that configuration uh, was done in a way that uh, the narratives, the stories, the imaginations, even which made us to be colonized, started from the minds of, of, of a few people, seeing Africa as a land that is not inhabited, that not habited, a land that is just for free, they call it the land of interest summer, and you'll find that in reflections of early writers of colonial heritage, people like Cullen Brixen, people like uh, Robert Ruak uh, in Uhuru, something of value. You will find that, uh, and you will find them in early, in early, in early twenties uh, and early sixties, and, and you will find them. And of course, even configuration of uh, these these places that we call the National Theatre, Norfolk here. These are all places that were that were being done to configure the history of, of our people. But we find in that history of 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 of, of of distorting history of liberation in our countries, you find also uh, writers and artists in, in the younger generations coming to to bring a new light into our history. And you find there were defiant songs that you found uh, within uh, within communities in Kenya. I think Kikuyus, we had Mudere, we had Dinia Msambwa, uh, we had people like, uh, uh, we, we had Aredouk and others who had their own literature. So literature still was a form of trying to to construct that history which was being presented uh, uh, in Kenya. But comes independence. Comes independence again, the whole history that was there with, with that before was not 
was not done very well in terms of bringing a new system. But also you find that history, the writers who came after independence, uh, the people like I think uh, Ablatif, people like Ngogi, Michel and others, uh, the older generation of us, uh, were trying not to, to, to reflect the history of the colonial history, but they were trying to hack into the call that history and art and literature is not only a mirror of that reality, but it must be able to shape that reality to the way people uh, would want to have their vision. So you find the, the betrayal of hopes with Kenyatta. Kenyatta didn't come from the tradition of, of, of Mau Mau. In fact, he was one of the people who betrayed the Mau Mau. He didn't have a new system uh, of order in the country. He didn't, uh, he didn't uh, bring uh, economy to the, to the people, the land. He didn't do anything much. He just took the whole pillars of colonialism and put them to the governance of this country. And only what that we had in Kenya was, was maybe black faces. Uh, just like Flanfalum says, uh, black uh, white marks, uh, white, uh, black faces but white, uh, white masks. So uh, that's what exactly he did. So and you find the liberation history that that was ignited by now people from those generations I've quoted about, and particular books like Ngogo Young, which many of us were, were read in the early years, a grain of wheat, where people like Black Ham, I mean, many, many books, books by Akara Wanjao, I think, who was writing completely mother tongue, completely were trying to configure that history. And even today, as young writers who are coming up, they are trying to reconstruct the history that we have been able to read about uh, in, in, many, in, in many forms to, to, new, to, new, to, new, to new stances. And I, and I think this is where uh, my interest lies. How does that literature, that we had from colonialism to, to early years of independence to today, how has that literature been able to inspire liberation, but also to launch and inspire social movements as we happen in the country? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, my question to, to Dina is, uh, you are the third Cape Verde person I know. I know of uh, Cesaria Evora, I love her music. I know of a Cabral, Abikal Cabral. So I, now you're the third, you're the third person I know. Um, so I wanted to ask, what is the story of Cape Verde that you he, that you hear others tell, and what is the story of uh, history of Cape Verde that you want to tell? So which are the two histories? The one that is constructed. And the one that you are going that you tell through your novels. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to see in your eyes, to listen your voice in this Africa, in, Ke in Kenya. Este era o sonho da Milcar Cabral. So, she wanted to introduce herself in English, but to express her ideas, she's more comfortable in, in Portuguese. So, you mentioned Amilcar Cabral, and, and she said her being here, that was his dream, uh, in a way. Amilcar Cabral dizia que ele era um filho da África e que queria honrar ser africano. Amilcar Cabral always said he was a son of Africa and um, he, he e queria honrar ser africano. And wanted to honor, uh, honor that fact. Por isso, Amilcar Cabral deu início a uma luta de libertação para a Guiné E Cabo Verde. And so he, because motivated by that, he started the, the liberation movement in, in Guinea, uh, Guinea-Bissau now, and Cape Verde. Durante 500 anos, Cabo Verde foi uma colónia de Portugal. For 500 years, Cape Verde was, a, uh, was colonized by Portugal. Então a nossa história, praticamente, a nossa história, a história contada por Cabo Verdeanos, começa in 1975, when we became So, uh, in many ways, our, our history begins with independence uh, in, in 19, 1975. Um, 
Antes eu quero dizer que Cabo Verde está situado na costa ocidental da África. Somos dez ilhas. Estamos a duas horas de Senegal. So okay, Cabo Verde is in the Atlantic Ocean with ten islands. Duas horas de two, two hours away by plane from Senegal. Somos umas ilhas secas, pobres, We're, mas muito bonitas. We are uh, poor islands, dry but very beautiful. Durante, durante 500 anos, a história que se contou foi um, um capítulo da história de Portugal. So, for 500 years, the history of Cape Verde that was told was as a chapter of Portugal's history. E o que se dizia da história de Cabo Verde é que foi uma ilha sem nada. Quando, quando os portugueses chegaram, não havia homens, não havia mulheres, apenas alguns pássaros. Okay. So the, the traditional narrative was that when the Portuguese arrived there, the islands were uninhabited, there were no people, there was nothing, just a few birds. Então o povoamento começa com escravos comprados aqui na África, no continente, e levados para as ilhas africanas de Cabo Verde, mais os portugueses. So, the story begins uh, with uh, people bought, slaves brought from the African content, continent, taken to the islands, uh, and then Portuguese uh, settling or, or uh, que running deu... that trade. Uh -huh. Sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. O que deu origem a que se fizesse um povo mestiço, o povo de Cabo Verde, com uma língua própria, que é o crioulo cabo-verdiano. E o resultado disso foi uma pessoa, uma mistura de pessoas, uma mistura no sentido das origens, mas também a língua que eles criaram, que é conhecida como crioulo. Eu sinto-me sempre muito órfã das histórias das minhas avós, porque elas não me contaram histórias. But I always feel a bit like a, an orphan uh, of history of, of the stories of my, uh, my, of my yeah. grandparents, but grandmothers in particular. Mas as histórias foram passando bocadinho a bocadinho, pouco a pouco. But that said, stories were passed down bit by bit uh, and, and, and still exist. Daí a nossa história ser uma história feita de, de bocados, como se fossem ilhas. A nossa história também é, é um pouco bocados, como se fossem ilhas. E, em um sentido, isso significa que a história passada por um bit by bit é um pouco como as ilhas em si, as dez pequenas ilhas que formam um todo. Quando ficamos independentes, uh, foi uma, uma história comum da Guiné-Bissau e Cabo Verde, Cabo Verde não tinha, Cabo Verde tinha cerca de 90% de analfabetos. 90%. 90%. Em so, a, a, a independence, and this was common of, of uh, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau as well, uh, illiteracy was around 90%. Mas o que se dizia, o que a história dizia, é que, que éramos umas pessoas inteligentes e alfabetizadas. But according to official history, we were clever and literate people. Nós hoje somos uh, um país democrático, livre. Somos um país de mais ou menos pobre, mas não há fome em Cabo Verde. By now we are a, a democratic and free country, still relatively poor, but uh, mais but uh, mais como era? Sim. A última palavra. Então, pobre ainda, mas bonito. Não. Mas estamos... Não, pega mais. Eu quero follow up uh, talking about your book, um, The Mad Woman of, of Serrano. Um, just an overview. The book is about a, a small sort of village where they are visited by some colonialists and because of the trauma that visits them, the, the community decides we are not going to, to let any strangers come. So that means that the community starts to construct a certain kind of history, except that there are these uh, two characters. Oh, no, so what the characters do, like the mad woman, is the one who refuses to, to stick to the rules 
of the village as she tells the histories as she sees them. And then there's the midwife, the midwife who also, because she knows the histories as people are born, she's able to tell the histories of, of, of this community. But I wanted to talk, uh, oh, okay. What I, I wanted to ask is this, the first chapter is a very powerful chapter about the the um, the registration the naming of the community because before the the village did not have a name and then now these people come and force the village to adopt a name and the word registration you uh, you know there's always talk of of registering registering the town registering the people people who are measuring the the town and mapping it out and i want to tie that to what you said about figures and numbers that that our histories are written in figures and numbers and on paper but the people tell a bigger story so i wanted to ask about um is this is this a true story of what happened to to serrano these people coming to measure and document and register and what does that do to people and then I would like you to also connect that to the dam. The, later on in the book, there is a dam that is built and, and uh, it ha people are evicted. So what, what is this relationship? Yeah, what is this relationship between the people and these constructed figures and maps and narratives and development? And how do the characters in your book uh, um, defy defy that? Então, <laughs> As, as histórias são verídicas. Em Cabo Verde temos povoações completamente isoladas. Em Cabo Verde temos populações analfabetas. São os meios pequenos, onde cada pessoa pensa que sabe a história do outro. So, uh, it, it, there's truth in the sense that in Cabo Verde there are lots of isolated small communities um, where uh, isolated from everywhere else, but within the community, everyone knows or at least thinks they know the history or the story of everybody else. E onde os homens têm o seu espaço e as mulheres o, o dela. And where men often or, or have their own space and women have their other place or space. E há um silêncio enorme nesta povoação chamada Serrano. And therefore, the, the overall effect is there's a huge silence that uh, sort of enwraps places such as this place Serrano. O que a mulher de Serrano, a louca de Serrano, quis mostrar é que por trás do silêncio há um ruído enorme. So, the role of the mad woman really is to show that behind that silence is a lot of noise. O que ela quis dizer é que por trás da, da calma há, um, há uma violência intolerável. So, she, what she is sort of saying, the mad woman is. On the surface is calm, but vi behind that calm is, is violence. Yes. And, and um, wh what is the role of the outsider? Because I, I sense that, that the narrator does not approve of, of the way the community decides to protect itself from, out, from the outside. So what is the relationship between the village and the outside, and even when people go to the city, what what does that do to the history of the people? Eu acho que é uma característica das pequenas comunidades se autoprotegerem. Uh, she, she thinks it's a, a characteristic of all isolated communities to, to self-preservation. Uh, e depois, quando as pessoas da cidade chegam à, à comunidade, são alegres, são felizes e mostram um mundo, um mundo impressionantemente belo lá fora. So, besides to come back what you're saying of the bringing dams and disruption, but the locals also see that they seem to be, they seem to also bring a bit of joy or a bit of 
something else. But they seem happy, they joke, and then they, they, they suggest other possible lives. E a pergunta da louca era: vocês vão conseguir viver na cidade? So the mad woman is, is sort of asking them, okay, you're, you're tempted like this, but I, uh, could you manage to live there? Are you prepared uh, to, to make that leap? E elas fechavam-se mais, as, as populações fechavam-se mais. And they shut themselves down because maybe not, maybe they're, 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 they're not ready to, to yeah, make that leap or even uh, make the mental leap, let alone the physical. Para o exterior. Esta comunidade significava alguém que pagava imposto. Meanwhile, from the outside, the, the sort of attitude to such small isolated places was simply that's a place that pays taxes. E vendia umas coisas artesanais. Maybe sold some artisanal handicrafts and some fruit. É a violência do, do meio urbano sobre o meio rural. So, uh, this is a, 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 the violence committed by the urban world to the rural world. Um, okay, um, and I'm going to go to Yunjuki because she's just mentioned silence and the fact that the community is being challenged. There's a character in the novel that challenges the community to accept their history. So this silence is not just imposed from outside, but it's almost like a local agreement. So I don't know whether you'd like to comment on our silence as Kenyans and how we we ourselves impose this silence on the on our own histories. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> thank you. I, I think um, uh, you you. I think many many of you even have read the I think the book by Yvonne. It talks about the three kinds of silences that we have in Kenya. I, I know some people, I think silence is, is one of them. I think memory, and I think the third one. English Kiswahili and silence. Yes, English Kiswahili and silence, yeah. yeah. So I think that butchering of memory has, has, uh, and, and has, has created a lot of silence uh, in Kenya. <coughs> Sorry for me. But uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, the psyche that was put even within and inserted within the people uh, many years even after in Julian colonialism was this kind of us lacking a voice and you'll find even in terms of activists and other people saying that they are speaking uh, for the people presuming that uh, the people are voiceless and to me I argue that the people really have never been voiceless the people have been silenced so there's a big thing about people being voiceless and people being silenced and that silencing of us has been created a, a, a lacuna in terms of not being able to express exactly what is deep within ourselves. And this is where literature comes and art comes much more. That you don't only give voices to these people who are silenced, but you're also trying to give visions of hope that people can learn to when you're an artist and a writer for that matter. So these silences are there. The memories have been pushed. We, do, for example, in the colonial times, we 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 don't know uh, the extent, unless our writers now are writing about the Mau Mau movement. We 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 had a whitewash narrative that you find uh, in a lot of writers even before, during the colonial, during the post-colonial times, early years of independence. You find the same silences, like for example, what you mentioned about the Wagala massacre and others. So I've been silenced. But the good thing is it all that art does not only bring these narratives to the open. But art also tries to enable enable people. And there's one writer who says that I think it's, uh, it's I think it's, it's Ellen. She says that literature should not bring down people. It always tries to uplift people. So these silences that we have always been subjected, our writers and artists definitely have been trying to lift them up. Okay. Um, uh, Nuvuyo, I, I I saw you talked about the Gokuraundi uh, massacre of the Ndembele in the, I think it was the early 80s. Um, and you say that it had an impact. Did you know about it or you stumbled on it? And uh, what did it take for you to, to dig more about it? Was there a, res a resistance? I mean, just tell us, walk us through what it meant to, to explore this history. Okay, awesome. So in answering your question, I'll also try and respond to some of the thing, interesting things that have been said. 
Um, so kukura hundi um, is a Shona word um, for the early rain that washes away the chaff before the spring rains. So it used to be a positive thing, right? Um, farmers looking forward to um, the season of planting and harvest and all of that. Um, and then from 1982 to 1985, um, Mugabe sent um, um, the specially trained force called the 5th Big Brigade. They were trained by North Korea, Kim Tusang. Um, I think it's the father of the current, you know, this 30, is it the 31 year old um, North Korean leader who's, um, you know, wreaking havoc. Um, so he sent them to Matebele land. So in Zimbabwe, there's Mashona land. There's Matebele land created again by British colonialism, misunderstanding of how um, ethnicity epistemologies work, right? So that was that distortion that was carried over. And this was a state sanctioned massacre or genocide. Um, it was politically motivated, but it ended up uh, being um, an ethnic sort of cleansing. And why that was, was because the, the soldiers, so ZANU, look, there was ZAPU. ZAPU was the big liberation war uh, movement party. Then ZANU broke away from ZAPU. During the time of ZAPU, there were no ethnic divisions in the liberation war movements. But when ZAPU and ZANU broke up, ZAPU became more of a Ndebele, Matebele land type of party, and ZANU was seen as more from a Shona land. So um, currently, the Shona ethnicity makes up about 82% of Zimbabwe. The Ndebele ethnicity makes up about 18%, uh, then the rest are uh, other ethnicities who also interestingly feel oppressed by the Ndebele ethnicity the way the Ndebele's feel oppressed by the Shonas. Um, so the, the fifth brigade was Shona speaking and they went to Matebele land and they were terrorizing the people of Matebele land um, looking for dissidents because of clashes between Zanu and Zapu. Now it's estimated there are about 400 dissidents but um, 20,000 is seen as a conservative figure, about 20,000 plus Ndebele's were massacred in search of the 400 dissidents. And so that's why it's a very controversial. So they you know they'd go there, they'd do really horrible things um, and force the villagers to sing praises to Mugabe and Ndebele, denigrate themselves in Ndebele. And I'm linking this back to um, the idea of our pre-colonial history. So I, I think that the sort of role loosely speaking, because I, I don't think we should prescribe roles on artists in my generation, is to continue, um, the idea of continuing revolution for me is a question of constantly critiquing the past. And for that to happen, it's also to critique the liberation movements, and therefore to critique their understanding of pre-colonial history, which has affected where we are now. Um, so the justification for this in Zimbabwe, and it's, it's a popular justification, it is not in any way true, is that this is payback to the Ndebele people for what they did to the Shona pre-colonial, in pre-colonial times. It's a very powerful emotive thing, but you are now um, crossing over different epistemologies, right, from pre-colonial history, a different way of understanding the world to the British sort of um, imposition. Another thing that's problematic, again, the liberation movements, they were necessary for their time, but there were mistakes they made, and that's why we should continue critiquing them is the fact that this idea of, a, of an idealized African pre-colonial history is very dangerous and detrimental to where we are in the present and where we're going forward, and it, it's outdated, right? Um, um, in the sense that there, there was no pure, like there was no one big pure African identity, one. Mm -hmm. And two, what colonialism did, and this is the great danger, this is why our post-colonial movements mirror colonial practices, it didn't distort not only the black African, it distorted the, the white European, and also just history in general. Mm -hmm. Before the advent of full-blown colonialism, cultures actually intermingled. There is no one culture that is pure. Cultures are all hybrid everywhere in the world. There was trade between different cultures all over the world before the full-blown advent. And that's the sort of repatriation I'm interested in because it's a more realistic, actually, understanding of that history and of how we live today. So outside of the state narratives, the idea of people, when, story, when we say stories are bigger than people, for me, it means that they also spill out of any easily definable, containable identity, whether it's Shona and Devele um, and all of those things. And so my problem even with the, the idea of uh, literature uplifting a people, because that happened in Zimbabwe in the 80s, the socialist movement, for me an artist must always be ambivalent with their society. Liberation has to continue. Therefore independence was not a point of liberation even for the artist. The artist must always be suspicious of power. And we see that in the 80s, Tambudzo Marichera, have you heard of him? Popular Zimbabwean writer, he's seen as the one writer in our 80s who 
um, um, he predicted what would become of us now. He was greatly derided in Zimbabwe at the time. He was seen as too radical, anti-socialist. I think he had a fight with one of the big Kenyan writers as well. The African community didn't like him because at that time socialism was very popular and the idea of socialism post-independence was the artist uplifts society. The mm. artists must, there were all these social um, 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 organizations, a very good idea. But the problem was the post-colonial independence movements were, were corrupt at that time. And therefore that, that socialist idea um, sort of um, covered that up rather than opening it up. So I like the Dambuzo style of, of, of critique of always being ambivalent, always being at leggerheads with power and being able to critique that power always, whether it's, it's post-liberation movement, because we need, the liberation movement's role I mean, was to bring us independence. It was not to take, they should not have, none of the liberation movements should have ruled as long as they have, and it's because they're defunct, their purpose was mm. realized at independence, then they continued mm. to become a corrupt, entity that no longer serves its function that we're where we are now so yeah and um, um so how did you did you know about this massacre as a young as a young person and when you discovered it where did you okay. know how did you uncover it i guess okay yeah uh, so because right so we grew up knowing about Bukura Hundi, but not knowing it because again it was not fashionable to critique yeah so it was seen as you're bringing down our 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 efforts at liberation so it, um, so for unity's sake, let's not look at this period. Let's not talk about it. Let's not see what happened. And so it was when I was doing my research on Zimbabwe um, a few years ago in South Africa that I came across um, readings of the Catholic Church Commission reports on the genocide. And then that's when it struck me. So this is me as a young person, 20s, now really trying to look at the history, which is say to really sit and think about it. And then it hit me that my own mother was a teenager during the Liberation War and in her early 20s during the genocide. Yeah. That's when my interest was piqued. And when I asked about the genocide, the massacres, she became uh, very upset. This is like in the 2000s. And then it moved for me from being this um, history, right, from being something that happened that we shouldn't look at, to something that seemed very present emotionally, like a wound that I could see affecting her. And that's what impacted my prime interest in that period um, and trying to look at it as part of the novel. Okay. Um, um, before we open the, the floor for discussion, I have one last question. From your experience as writers and activists, what is the interest of the younger generation in history and in your own writing? And, and we'll start with Dina. Eu, quando escrevi este livro, foi em 1984. Ah, sim, sim. Uh -huh. Mais um. E que, o que eu quis mostrar é que o colonialismo não tem culpa de muita coisa. And part of the, the objective for her was to show that to bring it back to what you were just saying to show that colonialism wasn't uh, responsible for everything you couldn't blame everything on Porque nós tínhamos no começo tínhamos a, a tendência de dizer culpa do colonialista culpa do colonialista mm -hmm. yeah, because at, at that time that was what everyone was blaming everything on uh, Então nós todos os mais velhos Começamos a fazer todo um trabalho com os jovens para mostrar que dependia deles e de nós construir um país, não um grande país, mas um pequeno país onde a gente pudesse viver com dignidade. Mm -hmm. So, even then, she said her generation, or, or people who were, uh, were, were older than, uh, older and writing, they have been working since then to encourage the young people to say, it's, it's your responsibility to, to question uh, these narratives and to, to, to build the, the country uh, yourselves. Eu acho que foi uma estratégia boa do, do governo na altura e da, e da sociedade também responsável ter posto o acento tónico no trabalho das pessoas que estavam lá. Mm -hmm. and, so that, and I think it was a good decision to, to, to prioritize that or to, to at least encourage uh, young people who were there to, 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 uh, yeah, to invest in them. 
porque em poucos anos nós ficamos alfabetizados em quase quase 90%. Uhum. Nós temos nós temos médicos, temos enfermeiros, temos agricultores a trabalhar naquilo naquela pouquinha terra que é possível. Uhum. And uh, quite progress was made quite quickly. She said earlier 90% were uh, illiterate and very quickly that figure returned and 90% were, were literate. There are trained nurses, uh, teachers, etc. All the, the, the... Mas o país que nós temos não é suficiente para, Cabo Verde, para os cabo-verdianos, nem é um país de sonho, nem é um país que a gente queria que fosse. That doesn't mean that the, the, what we've got is enough. It's not a, a dream place. There, there's uh, still work to be done. É um país ainda com problemas que este livro, a Louca de Serrano, transmite. So, although she wrote this book in the 80s, it, the issues that it's thrown up are still relevant and still need to dealing with. Temos uma mentalidade patriarcal. Temos uma violência doméstica muito grande. Temos uma violência de género também visível e temos ainda muitas dificuldades. É ainda uma sociedade patriarcal com violência doméstica, violência contra as mulheres, especialmente. Estas são todas as questões que ainda precisam ser tratadas. Há um movimento de mulheres, sobretudo de jovens, que me perguntavam, movimento de, movimentos de, de mulheres que querem ter um espaço na sociedade, querem ter emprego, querem ter voz. But there are at the moment uh, lots of groups of, of young, but especially young women, uh, making these demands, saying we need space for us. We're not accepting this anymore. Por quando eu escrevo sobre mulheres, eu também estou a escrever sobre o homem, estou a escrever sobre a família, estou a escrever sobre a qualidade de qualidade de relações que se estabelecem na família, na sociedade. But she said, although I write about women and uh, why the work is women focused, it's not just about women. I'm writing about men, and part of this is to, to try and uh, encourage uh, the understanding that everyone gains uh, from, from from making progress uh, in these areas. Nós dizemos atualmente com a internet, com os meios de, de comunicação eh, facilitados, os jovens não querem saber muito de leitura. Uh -huh. On the other hand, with social media, internet, etc., the, the, the common thought is that the young, young people will, uh, are no longer so interested in, in literature. Leitura em livro, porque na internet eles passam o tempo todo a ler. Uh -huh. But this literature in the physical form of the book and there's literature, there's reading, there's other ways of... Uh, Os meus livros são dados na escola como material obrigatório. Mm -hmm. uh, a Louca de Serrano já na universidade. Uh -huh. And her books are, are, are taught in school, they're, they're on the, the, the syllabus and studied at university. I really encourage Kenyans to read The Mad Woman of Serrano because it spoke to me about how, you know, what she's saying, that it's not just colonialism that is to blame for everything. Um, in this book, it is the local people who reinforce the silence. It's, it's the, and, and this is something that happens in Kenya a lot, that the people who enforce the silence is not even the states, it's our relatives, especially where, we come, where I come from. It's, it's our families that, uh, that enforce the silence. Um, so, back to you um, about the youth. What is the interest, from your experience, what is the interest of the youth in history from what you've seen? Um, I'd say, I think in Zimbabwe, um, even personally, and looking at other youth, because it is an interest in history, it's a way of trying to find your place and again in Zimbabwean society and find that investment. Because what happened, um, so with the, you know, the liberation movements, I, I grew up, I, I was born after the liberation war, so we're called born freeze, which is a derogatory term to say you didn't fight in the war, you have no say. So this has been the constant thing um, to reinforce that, the idea that only those who fought in the war, those who sacrificed have a right to Zimbabwe. And so what that leads to is apathy, it leads to disillusionment. Um, you know, you're depressed, you don't feel like you have a space 
um, and I think still an ongoing issue in Zimbabwe, um, where in Zanukia, the main party, the, 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 the youth league leader was 54. <laughs> he was ousted recently in the party. So it's that idea. Um, so it's, I think it's a way of also trying to say it's our history. Um, we want to own it and claim it. Um, we have a right to that history. And because we are the ones who are going to inherit the future, um, we cannot just sit back and be apathetic. So in a way, it's also, I'm now contradicting, but it's also a way of giving hope, exactly what you said, actually. Yeah. It's a way of giving hope um, to youth so that we feel the impetus to participate in our countries. Because without hope, um, there's actually, you're not motivated to even help improve your countries or have a stake in your countries. Yeah, I, I, I think it's good that you've, you've come back to that reality. But um, I'll, 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 I'll start maybe with, uh, uh, with what you, you said really initially about uh, Dabuzo and uh, the, the socialist dilemma that uh, writers had. And I think one of the beauties of uh, uh, the socialist realism well, that was there uh, was unlike writers and artists uh, giving expressions of uh, despair, telling the conditions which exist. Uh, uh, the beauty of it all was that they were trying to, to, to give people a new reality that people can struggle for. And this new reality was not only in, in, in your countries, but also globally. It was a global movement that was trying to get new pillars uh, for governors. And we found that even Tanzania, Nyerere, and people like Ibrahim Husseini, we found that in the literature that was happening in Kenya, people realizing that the freedom has been betrayed, there is a lot of dissolution, but what is the hope? And the biggest nightmare has been right as an artist. You give a lot of reality. You say there is frustrations, there is poverty, there is all those things, but then what are the pillars that exist there? So I think that is, uh, is, is why the socialist realism was, and even today is, is very current in, the, in, in, in a lot of minds and the, for the people. Now, coming to the, the new vistas for, for liberation for young people, and I think any, any artist, any writer, will be able to read so well the signs of the times and see what is the new revolution that people will launch into the, themselves onto. And what kind of art, in terms of form and structure, will you launch yourself into that revolution? And when we talk about revolution, we talk about two, two constructions. We talk about maybe the state, where you want to overthrow the state and create a new, a new state. But also you want to talk about whether you talk about the cultural revolution, for example, the one that is talked about by people like Gramsci and Michel Mogo of talking about art being a liberated zone. You must be able to launch those two arguments. And, uh, but any artist sometimes who, 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 who writes out of, uh, out of the popular movements uh, that happen at a given time, that artist always becomes sometimes, uh, you might lose a voice, might become repetitive, might not even have a following. And when you make your art, as a movement itself, as a music, your music, your literature as a movement, then that is how that art will become possible. And then the last thing is that, uh, uh, for example, I was, uh, I was uh, when I was coming to this morning, uh, I had a colleague in the morning, a comrade of mine who is called Tirop Kitur, and uh, she, 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 he, he's one of the detainees uh, of Moi, uh, people who know about Moi Kenya and in this country. But when she heard that I was coming to talk about the, the, a little bit about literature of, uh, of, of Guinea-Bissau, and Mikal Cabra is very strong and cultural revolution, and he reminded two things. That one thing, there's a street in Kenya named Cabral Street. I know Kenyans know it, yeah? There's Cabral Street. There's a street there. So we recognize that. But also another thing which I did, I'd forgotten. She, he reminded me about the book, the popular book in Kenya about Cabral is Unity and Struggle. But when Cabral was asked by the people during his times, you say that we, have, we must have gorillas, uh, we have no forests, we have no wilderness, we have no hills. Cabral replied that the people are our forests. So that is that. Okay, that's a nice, nice point to end on, on as we open the discussion. Um, so do we have any questions? Oh, okay, I'll take in, uh, let me see, one, two, five. Okay, I'll take in groups of three. Let me start with this column and then we'll, after the answer, we'll go to this, this column. So one, two, there was somebody behind, three. Um, let's start with our brother here. Oh. Thank you very much. I think I'll stand. I'm an old man, and sitting down for a long time is not very good. Um, 
My name is Ambassador Kahende. Thank you very much for the engagement we have had this morning. Very powerful. Um, I think the commonality we have in the three countries is that we all came out of liberation struggles where arms were used. And I think that's where, as far as the comparison goes. To Njuki, the master of social movements, in 1963, our venerated president, Jomo Kenyatta, stood on the podium and asked the Kenyans, forget the past. What did that mean in terms of the liberation movement? Did it mean that we forget what the Mau Mau's had done? Did it mean that we forget what the home guards had done in terms of massacre? I refer you to Larry Massacre. What did let us forget the past mean? And where has it led us as a country to now? The second one is that the same boys of Jomo Kenyatta went to Nakuru. There was a uh, uh, white settlers assembled in a hotel. And he urged them, don't go away. There is room for everybody in this country. These are the people who are occupying 80% of our most fertile land being encouraged to stay here. And yet, the Mau Mau movement had another name. It is called the Land Freedom Army. If the white man was going to stay, still occupying 80% of our most arable land, what had the Mau Mau fought for? Okay. Now, the last one is to okay. my sister here. I worked okay. in your country for some time. Thank you very much for what you said. You also went through your Chimurenga. You did it very well. By 1979-1980, we were fighting in the United Nations that we have um, one man, one vote. Because the imperialists they had another plan. Yeah, you know it. Yeah, you're a bishop and a white man too. Uh -huh. But we fought and we won. In comes Mugabe. But in six years, by 1986, I, I know about the massacre um, of the 5th Brigade. In six years, we have the will get uh, eh, corruption. Six years of this most wonderful liberator and a wonderful Chimurenga, and even his masters, Nyagumbo, are killing themselves because they have been discovered, stealing state uh, funds. So you could tell us, maybe um, based on, on, uh, on the social movement, uh, standpoint of view, why are our liberators serious? Those ones who fought very seriously, like in Zimbabwe, and those who did not fight at all, like Kenyatta, had something in common, the betrayal of the people, and they called for silence. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this lady, and then I'm um, trying to keep your questions short. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much to the presenters. My question and comment is directed to Shuma. First, just to say your book was amazing, really. Congratulations. If you guys haven't read it, you must read this book. Uh, one is a comment, uh, comment question, is that at the, when we finished reading the book, we read it at, my, at the book club, we said, what must, have, what must it have done to her to have written all this, just the weight of it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, frankly, by the time we got to the massacre, I was completely betrayed because we've done so much about liberation history. I'd, we'd heard rumors about the massacre, but we didn't believe it because of the person who was talking about it, and as usual, you're just trying to put down Africa. And then you wrote about it, and now we had really had to believe it. So one, to write a book without any sort of politicization, to tell it as a story. I mean, that was fantastic, you know? That. Um, so one, what did it do to you as, your, as a person, Psyche? And two, which is related to this question we're asking, because for us, at the end of the book, you killed us, frankly, you really did. You destroyed us. When the picture goes up, and he's now sitting in the sitting room, 
We were so helpless. It was hard to have the next book club meeting, frankly speaking. Can I tell you, we ended up reading Pride and Prejudice. Truly, we did. We were so destroyed. And, and even now, I mean, we don't have answers. So what, what do you want us, what's going to happen, you know? Um, no, sometimes they don't give you hope, these writers. <laughs> but it was a good reality. It was very, very good. I mean, to even include the social media, the... Wow, very good. Really, I'm, really very good. I'm looking forward. You have I'm to. I'm looking forward you must. to that book. You must. Okay, um, Margaret. Hi. It is wonderful to be in this space and to meet you all. My question is, as a writer, what do you do to get to that level of consciousness where you know this is exactly what I want to do with this bit of history in my writing? Like, how do you raise that consciousness to that level, especially for the younger generation? Is it by reading more history books or by going into research or by taking history classes when they're in university? Thank you. I think I will give that the, the last question to Dina. Yeah. So we can go in the order. They will ask Juki and then Navuyo and Dina. Yeah, thank you. I thank you for the question, Bazit. And uh, there is, um, uh, I think, one of uh, the tragedies of, of course, uh, Kenyatta himself, the first Kenyatta. Now we have a second Kenyatta. We call them in Kenya, Kenyatta one, Kenyatta two. Uh, is that the Kenyan uh, independence was a compromised uh, package uh, which was given to moderates within uh, the, the entire freedom struggle. The moderates are uh, Kenyatta led by Kenyatta. Of course, there were others who were brought on board there. And when Kenyatta uh, got into independence, he didn't want to change any structure that was there before uh, for colonial structures. So he took lock, stock, and barrel, the entire structure, the colonial edifice is what he took. Uh, and that's why his quotes that we forget the past, he wanted us to not so much remember about the betrayal, the frustrations, the, the, the massacre of history that was happening. He wanted people to just be having like a, 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 like a painkiller of some sort and to be able to, to, to go into the new system uh, without a lot of questions. And you remember, uh, he surrounded himself with uh, the former uh, pe people who didn't fight for the freedom because he didn't want a lot of questions. And that's where you find even the early writers, uh, for example, like you remember the, the book Ngogwa, The Younger Grain of Wheat, uh, talking about the, the way different people are reacting towards the coming independence with a lot of excitement, a lot of hopes from all races, from all generations. But within the few years of that, uh, of that there were a lot of frustrations. And Kenyatta started suppressing the voices of the people, and particularly from the social direction. Uh, Piogama Pinto was killed almost a few years after independence, in 1964. Uh, Bilad Kagia was suppressed uh, within KPU and Janamogi. And, uh, and Uhuru and Janamogi wrote the book, Not Yet Uhuru, right after independence. By 1969, uh, when, when, when this writer called Ablatif Abdallah was writing his, his famous book, Sauti Atiki, uh, Kenya to Endawapi. Uh, that short story, that short poem. It was completely a suppressive region that, was, that didn't want people to remember that history, which he was telling people to forget. And even that structure within the Cetras, when he was telling them, don't go away, uh, we shall stick here, it was still the same system of not bringing the right history and the right memory to the people. And this is the same tragedy that we have in this country, in terms of land, in terms of economy, in terms of culture, we are still so much beholden to the, the past that we wanted to, to run away from and recreate afresh. And the, you remember even uh, among us countries in Africa, I think Kenya is the only one that took the whole colonial edifice the way it was without any, in, 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 in any change at all at all. And you, 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 you'll find a lot of Kenyans here owning, uh, very, a lot of Kenyans owning, for example, land. is a big question here. It has never been settled. The same central land in White Highlands that was taken over by the white people and the colonialists the same land that was taken over by this, the, the African people, and even today there's no change in that large structure. Maybe unlike, unlike maybe what Mugambe tried to do. So first of all, I you know, want to acknowledge as a born free, like we're really, we're really 
grateful for the Chimurenga because it made people like us possible. It was a very important time. And that's an important thing because I, like my generation, who, my impulse is to want to critique the Chimurenga, a critique out of love, which is to find out what went wrong. Um, and you know, the, the, that culture of corruption that we, we see post-independence in Zimbabwe, if you read the history during, it started during the liberation struggle. It started within that, it was a culture that began then, even that culture of um, lambasting people, um, violence against people, it's things that are controversial we might not be able to talk about in Zimbabwe. Because even Joshua Nkomo, whose father Zimbabwe, who's idealized, who's idolized, who I love greatly, um, he, he, so some of the practices that they started during the liberation war, for instance, women um, during the anti-imperialism fight, um, there were these demonstrations in the city and then there were women who uh, several times who um, complained about being attacked if you're seen wearing European clothing, right? Like you don't have your duke on properly. They were beaten up, sometimes they were raped as a, like as a, you know, anti, as a revolutionary struggle. These were things that happened during the war. And there was um, that violence, that um, inter-party violence started during the Liberation War where, and both Nkome and Gabi did that with Zanu and Zapu where they, you know, um, um, and um, encourage their supporters to go and you know storm the house of the enemy, you know take care of the sellouts. It's a culture that came post independence, and uh, the culture again of eating. It started. Um, if you read, there was a Chifombo base in Zambia, where the liberation, the guerrillas, there were some executions there, terrible because they were complaining that you know we see the leaders, we are following Maoist principles or trying to follow pre-colonial principles, but we see you leaders, you're flying around, you're eating lavishly, you're greedy. What is happening? Um, and so that, that's a, a, a philosophy that was one of the less pleasant philosophies that we carried over. Again, to be kind to that time, because I think it's easy post, you know, when you look back to be harsh. You know, that was a time, remember, socialism, Cold War, there was hope, like there was that internationalist hope that something new was coming. Then it collapsed, right? Um, and, and the collapse of Zimbabwe, of Mugabe, um, was without, it came, there was aid from, of course, Western Europe, which never lent a hand to the colonial powers and only took part in negotiating when they realized that um, change was inevitable. So it's, it's a complex number of reasons, but in order to hold our leaders accountable, because that eating is still continuing in Zimbabwe, the irony, of course, Mugabe is beloved um, for, you know, he's able to tell the West off, he brought the land reform program in Zimbabwe. I grew up during that period. We, you know, my mother was a teacher, we, like the people were st were suffering, whereas the the you know the liberation elite, the they were eating like um, it's like a cartel. Like they were running these schemes, money schemes. They and they still continue to do that. You'd see one minister with a house of like tw twelve rooms. Like okay, you suffered in the liberation. Do you need twelve bedrooms in your house? Um, so it's a, so it's this mentality, and I think it's also tied to colonialism. Um, and so there's this thing of. You know, when we're in power, I think we're talking about it. It's me and my people eat, and your people are not the people. It could be your supporters, your relatives, your village, your ethnicity. It's not everyone. We haven't gotten to that point. Um, I hope that sort of. Yo, <laughs> thank you so much for that um, very um, challenging question. <laughs> so I like to say, uh, and those beautiful comments, um, I like to say my novel is a question mark rather than um, one that provides answers. It, it was also, it's like a scathing love letter to Zimbabwe. It's, a, it's an angry book. And I, I didn't, so, you know, I wasn't aware. I, I wrote this in my early 20s when I started. I really wasn't aware of the project I was embarking on. I didn't know it would be that big. And it took seven years. And um, the idea of what now, you know, people are devastated. I've had many readers, you know, it's like horror. You want to laugh, you want to cry, you're horrified. And um, it, it comes out of, you know, in Zimbabwe, uh, we have this thing of we are, we're happy people, we're laughing people. For me, it's a crutch. It's a crutch. And we are the perpetual victims. So it's something I, it's, 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 it's in terms of fiction and human interactions, I was interested in the ambiguities. We were victims, we're also perpetrators, we're also enablers of our own fate. Um, so you will find the idea of um, a, a villain, right? An anti hero as a character succeeding in the novel. For me, is also that idea of um, our liberation, um, our liberators um, who have become 
so psychopathic and sociopathic, who we still revere, that um, Stockholm Syndrome. It's complex. It's not as easy as saying one is totally a victim, a villain, one is totally a hero, and Mugabe is a good um, um, evidence of that. He's a very controversial figure in Zimbabwe. People love him and then loathe him. Um, I loathe him, but I don't know if had I met him in person, would I have been impressed? You know, you're taken over. Um, so in writing the book, just very briefly, the unraveling, yo. Um, yes. <laughs> So this is my theory. So, so when I was writing the book, I was frustrated. I was in South Africa, I was missing home. And by then I was also suffering from something called psychosomatic disorder. So it's when you're stressed, um, you're, and, and, and the doctor's like, it's because of what you went through in Zimbabwe, post-traumatic stress disorder. And of course I didn't believe it at the time, but looking back, so it's an idea for when you're stressed and then your body um, releases it physically. So I was having seizures, fainting, really strange things, blackouts. Um, I think it's common in many societies like that have gone through trauma. And when that was going on, right, it's also a way of letting out the stress of being in that environment. I was now thinking, right, I'm angry, I feel um, unmoored, I'm trying to understand who I am as a person. I'm in this new society, South Africa, where Zimbabweans are stigmatized. I want to find out who we are, why are we the way we are. So I start reading up from the history, start writing the novel. And during that time, amongst many things, I found myself in, psych in a psychiatric institution or two, um, and it was because of that. And I'm linking that to the novel and the writing, the search for history, because I think it's all connected, trying to release, right? You live history, you embody history. History is also a way of trauma, and you're trying to release it or find a way for, 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 for that pressure to come off. And so when I went for, th I went for therapy when I was writing the novel, because I was told to. It, I was not, con you know, therapy is not a thing in our societies. I didn't really believe in it. I just went and did it because I was told to. I was in a foreign country. But something interesting happened. During that therapy, we started talking about the novel. So I actually took the novel through, I took it to therapy as I was writing. And I think it helped with the writing of some of those things. And of course, those things for me are necessary to write because exactly what, we also have that philosophy in Zimbabwe, the past is over. But what keeps happening is each time something traumatic happens in our country, our leaders say, from today onwards, it's over. We're starting again. But the same pattern keeps happening. And then because we've embodied it as a country, we keep saying as Zimbabweans, what is happening? Why is this happening? It's, it's a really, um, it's a cycle. And I was trying to, I know it's hard, but I, I just wanted, I just want us to look, even if it's hard, for our own sake, not for anyone else, not for the West, not for, for us, not for the leaders, but for us as the people. Quando, quando nós ficámos independentes, não havia nenhum livro escrito por mulheres. So at the time of independence, the, 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 there wasn't a single book written by a woman in Cape Verde. Havia muitos livros, sim, livros brilhantes que falavam das mulheres, da boa esposa, da boa mãe da mãe trabalhadora, da, da amante bela e dessas coisas fúteis sobre a mulher. But there were lots of wonderfully written books about pretty women, good wives, uh, happy homes, uh, wonderful women in that sense. Era a mulher, a mulher, a mulher era, era, era. Não havia uma mulher só. Não havia uma voz de mulher. Então nós sentimos esta dificuldade quando começamos a escrever que faltava que faltava a voz das mulheres, mas nós sabíamos que elas tinham voz. So in a way they were always a mother, a lover, etc. They were never just them, they were never alone. Uh, and in a way not having not having that was a way, was, was a motivation to, to, to provide those voices. Faltavam palavras e um espaço para essas palavras. Então nós começamos Não foi difícil escrever uh, esse livro e outros, outras colegas também escreveram e, e homens também escreveram sobre mulheres. Porque nós estávamos a lutar para que a mulher tivesse um espaço para ela, para ela se realizar. Não o espaço de casa, não o espaço doméstico, não o espaço da pequena lavoura, mas o espaço do parlamento, o espaço das grandes decisões o espaço na vida política e social de Cabo Verde. Então, então, português. Um, so there's two aspects that the, the, the women at the time didn't have 
the space, the physical space, uh, but also the words uh, were lacking. So, the, 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 I suppose the objective was to, to change that and to find a space for them that is not the home, was not the washing area, was not uh, a, a domestic place, but was parliament or places where decisions are made and where they uh, can be part of those decisions. Nós queríamos que as mulheres tivessem, contassem a sua história, a história que elas viviam e não a história que os outros diziam que ela vivia. Porque aqui é que estava a diferença. Falavam do parto da mulher, falavam da, da vida alegre da mulher ou da vida triste da mulher, mas não falavam a mulher como o ser que estava a fazer o país. So, on the one hand, the, to encourage uh, women to speak about being a woman, giving birth, working at home, but also to, to be part, to, to talk about being part of, the, again, the decision-making uh, process. Ao fim e ao cabo, nós, quando escrevemos, queremos acabar com o processo de silenciamento, de desmemorização da mulher. To come back to silence is to, to unsilence. Uh, and the connection, I think you were saying, is the, the, well, to memory, uh, the, 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 yeah, and silence the, the, the memory uh, of women, I suppose. Mas quando escrevemos, também queremos mostrar a responsabilidade que a mulher tem no processo de se fazer ouvir. Queremos mostrar a responsabilidade da mulher, por exemplo, na, paterni na maternidade irresponsável. De antes, nós falávamos que o homem era responsável por tudo o que acontecia na família. Agora estamos a mostrar que cabe à mulher ser responsável por tudo o que se passa na família também. Ok, so then when Dina and other women were starting to write, they, they, so they wanted to fill these gaps, but also to, to do it delicately, to, to not be one-sided in the other way, and to show that, uh, yes, that the, the man needs to take more of a role in the home, but also that the woman can't, uh, just blame, you know, uh, comes back to the village uh, we were talking before. So, so yeah, to, 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 to uh, take, to do things, but to, to give women a voice, but to do it responsibly. <laughs> okay, let's have the last three contributions. And I'm not going to bind our, our writers to answer them because we are really out of time. But I promised that I would give you a chance. Please be brief. We, we are really tight on time. OK, I'll, I'll try to be. The, um, so. No, 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 go ahead. It's you. OK, so um, Novuyo, I think you've mentioned something. If my high school history can and might be mistaken, given the nationalist histories that we have, um, this is the first Chimurenga war where the Ndebele and the Shona kind of had some relationship. And I think you've talked about um, maybe some fluidity of like identity those days. So could you shed some light on that? And then uh, Njuki, I think Kenyan history is also very much informed by what we call Whig history, progress. Like we think like um, history works, the history is a history of progress. And, and that's why Colonialism was presented to us as oh, to civilize us. And then when we look at, we got independence, uh, we got multi-party 92 and that sort of thing. And that kind of makes us romanticize certain parts of our history. So if you talk to those people who were involved in the 90s, it feels as though 1992 was the ultimate, what they call the second liberation, the so-called second liberation. It's, it seems as, it's kind of um, romanticized. Um, so I'd want to ask, if there's a death in literature, especially on social movements, um, on the reform movement of the 90s, mm. um, 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 we have had someone say that democracy, or God says, democracy of the elite by the elite for the elite in 1992. That's what he says in one of his. And then lastly, Dina, um, I know it's problematic for us to kind of look at uh, our identities as loserphone, francophone, anglophone, but when I kind of look at the general pattern, I think that there's some sort of um, similarity between loserphone and francophone where you have um, assimilation. So um, what I'd want to ask is in Kip Vade's case, uh, 
when there was that uh, pressure to abandon one's culture and kind of become a similando, like the person who has taken up Portuguese uh, civilization, was there any pushback from the communities to say that no, we are going to we are going to hold on to our cultures? Um, I had yesterday someone called your uncles talking about how that was difficult to hold on 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 the cultures that were the indigenous cultures. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, please be brief. I think yes, the microphone is there behind you. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, my mine is not quite a question. But it's a comment. Yeah, I'm going to No, it's a you. comment that will that will lead to a question. Please. Okay. I have lived in Zimbabwe and I've lived in Mozambique. And uh, uh, I know something about Angola quite a bit. And this is the reason why I wanted to comment because um, there is a difference between what happened in Zimbabwe in Mozambique and what happened here. Um, in Mozambique, when they became independent in 1974 or 5, uh, when the Portuguese were driven out, uh, the Mozambicans entered all the offices, all the houses, or they, you know, just took up everything. You rushed to get whatever you could. As a result, um, it was very difficult to organize the people because there was nothing organized as to how they were going to proceed with their independence. In Kenya, uh, we... I agree with the, you know, the, the speakers here. It was uh, organized. It was uh, negotiated. Lancaster House was um, actually a negotiating, <laughs> negotiating process. So we can't say we uh, walked into the offices in Nairobi here or anywhere. We it was a, it was organized and certain people were allowed to get into those offices and others were not and Mashambas the same. Um, can in I, can in I no, let me. I'm is, finishing with the Zimbabwe. Okay. In, in Zimbabwe, <laughs> in Zimbabwe, the movement, the people who are fighting in the war, and I know because. Even here, we had two ministers who, for, who, who looked for the money for the movement, very seriously, Dr. Mungai and uh, Dr. Munyawayaki. They went all over raising funds for the liberation movement. When Mugabe came in, he came in with his people from the forest, wherever they were, and they took up everything. And to this day, the ministers are still the same ministers who's, who have not died, but who were in the war. If you were not in the war, you are of no consequence. I think Navuya uh, would agree with me that this is the way it is. Very few people have managed to get there who have no credentials in the war. So I wanted to know whether that is uh, the case as you see it as a, as a writer. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. I'm going to ask, uh, unfortunately, I'm going to ask the writers to just say, keep your, your comments to one minute. What, uh, you can either answer the questions or you can, uh, you can say something else that, that is on your mind. But I'm sorry, we really need to finish. Yeah, please, you can come and talk to the writers after, after you're done. Yeah, we've stretched over the time. So um, we are going to go this way.
I honestly, for the first question, I think it's best if you talk after. It's like it's going to be a long explanation. I mean, the second one, it's more or less the same, except Mugabe never went to the forest and he was um, not an ideological man, if you read the histories. There was no ideology that he propounded. Um, he was a very practical, intellectual man. Um, Again, what happened during the forest, it's also controversial. There were two parties, Zanwe and Zapo, that's the problem. So it wasn't Mugabe's party alone that fought. There was Zapo that's been erased from history and the different strategies. But definitely um, the idea of being amongst the people was our strategy, which um, was very important. But again, we need to critique um, because it's not serving us right now. But very great, you're accurate on point. Yeah, great, thank you. I, I'll end my... My, my, my presentation with two, I think two quotes, which I like very much. One of them is by a writer, African-American writer, she's called Barbara, she says that the role of artist is to make the revolution irresistible. Uh, I like that quote very much. The second one is by a writer, William Faulkner, when he was the speech for the Nobel Prize, when he was asked uh, about the past. And he said the past is not dead. It's not even past. So those people telling us to forget the past is, uh, is lastly. But lastly, in terms of young writers and young people in this, uh, when a comrade of mine was killed by the system of Kenyatta in 1986, he's called Karim Indodo, and I think many people know it. We were, we were then, and I took over from him once he was assassinated, but the poetry that inspired us was this small book here, which I've borrowed from, uh, from Mukombozi Library. It's, I think many people know, when the bullets begin to, plow, to flower, poems, poems from Cape Verde, Angola, and Mozambique. But there is one poem which I would like to read, only two lines, uh, which inspired us to be able to bear the system that killed Karim Indodo. And this poem was called uh, the poem of Joao. And the poem was, uh, Joao was young like us. Joao had wide awake eyes and alert eyes. Hearts reaching forwards. I might cast for tomorrow, a mouth to cry, an internal no. Joao was young, young like us. Joao enjoyed art and literature. Joao, Joao loved poetry. Joao loved books of meat and soul, which breathe life, struggle, sweat, and hope. Joao dreamed of big rivers flowing uh, through Africa, spreading culture. For mankind, for the young brothers, Joao thought that books might be for all, Joao loved literature, and Joao was young like us. So for all the young people, I think once you, you look for the liberation, you must always remember that the white, and, or, uh, the white eyes that the youth have should be able to champion and fashion the revolution. Thank you very much. I will talk about the borders. So, in Africa, we in Cabo Verde feel that there is a border very big, which is the sea. Os, os habitantes do continente também sabem que o mar é uma grande fronteira. And to end by speaking about frontiers, borders, as you know, Cape Verde is the, the big frontier, which is the sea between the islands and the, the continent. Mas há uma, uma fronteira que foi construída, é a fronteira das línguas, como dizia o, o jovem que falou há bocado o inglês, o francês, então isto serve para nos separar. Agora, no século XXI, nós não podemos admitir que as línguas sejam uma fronteira que dividam uh, a África. So there's the, the, the border of the sea, but to, to go back to the, the young man's question, uh, uh, question yeah, there's the, the constructed borders of languages of francophone, lusophone, Yes, there are different languages, but in, in 2019, as perhaps hopefully we're proving here, uh, languages can no longer be uh, used as an excuse, uh, uh, as a border between us. There's, 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 we must be able to, 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 to uh, dialogue amongst ourselves. And, yeah, and that's why I'm here. Okay, please give a hand to our panelists. Um, before we go, just to let you know, there'll be a performance of their work um, at 1 p.m. today. So come uh, at 1 and sample 
what what they have written about. I want to say I'm so honored to be on this panel. I'm always excited to meet people from other countries. And, and I hope that we will continue. Um, please read their work. It's very exciting. And I hope to see you in the other panels and at 1 o'clock. So thank you very much. <laughs>